Okay, so this talks about gem cutter, the next step in gem hosting. Um, so I was originally thinking of when I started uh, this talk, it was going to be a pitch, and hopefully uh, people would leave the talk and say, "Oh, I'm going to try out this new service." And things have changed a little since then. <laughs> so um, I thought a different name for the talk would be best. So I thought of a Michael Bay-inspired uh, Gem Cutter: Revenge of the Gem Sources. <laughs> However, I don't know. This didn't work out that well in theaters this year. So maybe a more popular one like the Gem Cutter Saga. <laughs> but uh, I figured. No, I don't really like fake vampires. So I ended up going with, this is a story all about how my gem host got flipped turned <laughs> upside down. <laughs> all right, so my name is Nick Caranto. I'm a fifth year uh, software engineering and computer science major at Rochester Institute of Technology. It's, yeah, it's the really cold gray one. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a Bills fan. I don't care what you say about it, even though we just fired our head coach. And uh, I'm a Rubyist at Heroku when I'm not sleeping or in class. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I am QRush, or Crush, however you want to say it, at Twitter. And I'm at litanyagainstfear.com. Yeah, I like doing this. Uh, if you want these slides to play along at home, they're at next, N-E-X-T, dot Heroku, dot com. OK, so I figured I'd fail early and uh, show a demo <laughs> of the site. Um, so this is Gem Cutter in its current inc incarnation and live. Um, it's basically the next generation of gem hosts. Uh, it helps people find gems easier because it's actually a search function. And uh, I think it's really helped with um, just bringing out information about gems. And it makes publishing them ridiculously easy. I don't know if I should try it out right now, but uh, I can at least show the end result. <laughs> um, so let's see. Oh, that's probably not going to Hey, it worked. OK, so um, the end result is after you do a gem push, uh, the service accepts built gems. So you do a gem push, and then you get this awesome page with just the information you need. So uh, basic information on how to install it. You can copy it. Uh, uh, simple information about what it is, what it depends on, where uh, assorted resources live. And um, this is awesome. Uh, there's also a directory. And since we launched, let's see if this works. Come on, Wi-Fi. I think it's getting close to 1 million downloads on GemCutter. So GemCutter has been very successful. So sorry I can't do a demo. This isn't my system. I was going to do a push and everything, but it's OK. Uh, so yeah, the history of the project. Uh, I originally started this in January of this year. Um, I started hacking on a project called Jekyll. Jekyll is a static site generator that runs GitHub pages. Uh, I originally found Tom Preston Werner's blog about it, and I was sick of WordPress, and I wanted to use this brand new system. So I forked the project on GitHub, made some changes, and then I clicked the little button and um, got my fork gem. And that was great. But something didn't feel right about it. And I started talking to him and Josh Nichols, the guy behind Jeweler, about what could be made better about the situation. Um, it seemed that people had stopped using Ruby Forge. And that seemed really weird to me, because Ruby Forge is like the default gem host. It's where everyone gets their gems from, no matter if they like it or not. So it seemed like there was this problem where, like, why aren't we using this, this site that's at the center? And I wanted to fix that. So came up with all these crazy ideas. And I basically spun my wheels for a few months until RailsConf. And I started really asking people, hey, would this work? Uh, am I really this crazy? And um, Ended up that I really learned I had to just try it out. So I went home, I started hacking on it. And I would say in August, we launched. And by launch, I mean we got featured on Ruby Inside. And I had hoped to have some sort of like beta period for the site. And that just, and when that launch happened, it's like, there's no point. The site's out there, people are using it, let's just roll with it. So I'd say we've been really running since July, but August is when people really started using it. And then in October, um, start, I came together with the Ruby Central guys on figuring out how to make this the default um, host. Uh, I had a little proposal that said, let's keep Ruby Forge alive, because we need to. People depend on it for a lot of stuff that I never want to put in GemCutter. And um, I wanted GemCutter to be the default host from the very get-go, because that I felt like it wasn't going to survive as a competing service. And that's really not why I started it. I started it to improve 
the whole situation. So uh, in October, we finally got together with the Ruby Central guys, and we figured out how is this going to work. And now gemcounter.org is gems.rubyforge.org. So this is huge. Um, it's live right now, um, and it's awesome. And we're going to be moving the site towards rubygems.org. Uh, rubygems.org is going to become the community gem host. Hopefully that's what we're going to rebrand it as. It's going to look exactly the same, just a different title. So hopefully it'll make sense that this is a community supported project that um, everyone can use and is a lot easier. So um, this has been a, a lot of fun to work on so far. And uh, I don't know, I guess the thing is that everyone sort of has to use it. So I hope you pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. That's what's happened so far, that's the background. So I want to talk a, a little bit about the motivation behind starting the project. So everyone knows Ruby Forge. It's the default gem host. Um, it's what we had to deal with, right? Um, at the very get-go when I was looking into gems with, with Jekyll, um, there was project approval, and that's been fixed recently. But I didn't like the fact that someone had to say, yes, you can do this. I just wanted to go ahead and do it. So that was one of the big gripes I had with Ruby Forge. And another big issue, which I think is more important, is it was written in PHP. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that a PHP site was at the center of the Ruby community. <laughs> um, so I wanted to fix that. Um, so the next big deal with gem hosting was the GitHub gem server. And he looks really sad on a dark background. But um, <laughs> so this was the new hotness. People obviously had problems with Ruby Forge, and they wanted to move on to something else. So I think the, f the forked gems that GitHub encouraged was great. Uh, and they are a great way to, to um, release code. I think uh, not having to dive through the bureaucracy or even ask people, hey, I have these little changes to your library, and they'll probably say, like, no, or, oh, that's awesome. But if they say no, then you're screwed. And I think um, having a way to easily publish um, little modifications or for, or for some gems is great, and GitHub provided that. Uh, at the same time, like that's an awesome workflow, but the real problem is that it creates all these um, fragmentations. So we've got, at least for some huge projects like Jekyll, Delayed Job, um, we've got all these projects that have tons of forks. And if you even try to look at the GitHub gem repository, they're just filled. So someone coming into the community who doesn't maybe know about sites like Ruby Toolbox, or the other recommendation type sites, they're not going to know which one to use. So I feel that GitHub gems are great, but there's that sort of fragmentation problem that we can't really help, and that needs to be fixed somehow. Uh, another big deal was has my gem built yet? org. So there's this delay between when you would give your code to GitHub and when it would be available to download. And I just thought that sucked. Uh, I didn't want to wait or continually refresh something until my gem was ready. I just wanted it to be ready. So I fixed that. Um, <laughs> um, so the way Gem Cutter works now is that it builds gems in under, or at least it indexes gems in under a minute. And I think that's a lot better. Uh, it used to, when you would gem push, it would uh, upload your gem to S3, rebuild the index, and then dump you back into the terminal. And then people started telling me, I don't want to wait five seconds for this to occur. So, now we just upload to S3 and then we kick off a background job to rebuild the index. And that usually goes in under a minute. So I'd say it's almost instantly available as downloads. So the real goals I started Gem Cutter with were I wanted accessible info. You guys saw the gem show, like the gem view. I wanted, I, I really modeled it after uh, Dr. Nick Williams' new gem page. So it's got uh, the version number, it's got what it is, how to install it. Uh, a little bit of information about the gem and like some other related info as well. And with Ruby Forge, you really didn't get that. You got a list of files, and that wasn't helpful. And with GitHub, you sort of get it, but it had it required effort. You had to create a README, and it wasn't standardized. So you might some gems might have a lot of information, and other gems you don't get any. So I wanted one place to get all the information about your gem. Uh, the next thing I wanted was publisher API. Uh, at the time, I had no idea how this was going to work. I was just sort of sick of the RubyForge gem scraping HTML in order to publish or in order to post forms and get version numbers. And GitHub simply didn't have an API; they just had a checkbox. 
So I wanted a REST API to push gems. So you would build a gem, give it to the service, and it would take care of the rest. Um, and finally, I wanted it to be open source. Uh, this sort of goes without saying, but I wanted people to make sure that they could contribute to the Ruby community site using Ruby. Um, so yeah, some tech behind the site. This is mostly going to talk about libraries I use and why I think you should use them and look into them. So the first big thing that Gemcutter is based on is AWS S3, and I'm sorry that's in the dead zone. Um, AWS S3 is a uh, Ruby interface to Amazon's simple storage service. Uh, as I moved Gemcutter away from my 256 meg Slicehouse instance, I realized <laughs> <laughs> the gems had to live somewhere else. And uh, downloading a few gigs of gems on that machine didn't go very well. So I decided that S3 was going to be the best place to put them, mostly because I was moving towards Heroku, and Heroku says, go there. So uh, I was at first fearful of this. I had never worked with S3 before. And uh, it ended up being really, really easy. And that is way too small. Is in monospace. Oh man, really? Now we're, are we in the dead zone? Yeah. All right, we're good. Okay, so sorry it's not all pretty, but uh, so the way this is done is you uh, subclass AWS S3 S3 object. Uh, you set the current bucket, which is basically a giant folder that uh, S3 dumps files into, and then so for gem cutter, it's gem cutter production. Uh, we obviously have switches for like staging and other environments. And then um, in order to put things in the S3, all you do is you call store on that class. So store with a key and then the value, so the data that we're pushing up to Gemcutter, and then a bunch of options like public read just to make sure that everyone can get to it. So I really didn't think it was going to be this easy to interact with a service that um, scales so well for file download, but it was. Um, so yeah, please look into that. Uh, the next big deal was Sinatra. Um, I started Gemcutter off as two little Sinatra apps. I didn't have Rails in mind at all. Uh, Sinatra has been one of my biggest influences as a Ruby programmer in the last uh, year or so. And if you haven't looked into it yet and you're just doing Rails development, please do. Um, it works so seamlessly with Rails now that it's almost silly not to look into it. Um, so I started Gemcutter off as two Sinatra apps. One was for the gem server, so I sort of had to look into how RubyGems served up gems, and I rewrote that in Sinatra instead of, I think it's just like a web brick handler now. And the other part was the site. So as I continued to move forward with development, I realized I needed users, so I dropped Sinatra for that. Um, I know there's a rack-based authentication plugins like Warden, and I guess there's Devise now, but uh, I didn't look into them enough, and I worked at ThoughtBot at the time, and I really liked clearance. So I wanted to use clearance, and I wanted to get the site on Rails. So the nice thing is that Sinatra is still a big part of gem cutter. Every gem that's downloaded now goes through Sinatra. And uh, it looks sort of like this. Um, like I said, uh, I, had two Sinatra, I had two Sinatra classes, really. And when I moved to Rails, I literally dropped it inside of App Metal, and it just works. That really blew my mind. I didn't have to do any configuration. It just dropped it in, and it was almost spooky. Um, so this is one example of uh, an action in Sinatra, and this is the giant index of gems. So it's a huge uh, gzip marshal array of every gem that's available on our service. Uh, and we set the content type to application as gzip, and then we serve it based on uh, if we're talking to S3 or the file system, because Gemcutter can work off of file system as well, which means you could run Gemcutter uh, behind your firewall, at your company if you want to. You can run it anywhere you want, really. It's not tightly bound to, S to S3. So having the gem server as a, like a separate component has been a huge win. And I uh, wrote a blog post recently about putting gem cutter into maintenance mode. So the deal with this is that now that the gem server is a separate component, we can load the hostess without loading Rails. So then we can run huge migrations if we need to, and gems serving will still work. So I won't kill the entire Ruby community for a night. <laughs> um, so this is basically what the rack up looks like, and it's getting cut off. But uh, we bring in the bundler environment, which uh, we're on. Uh, the Rails environment, 
And then we load up rack static, which is in uh, the rack library. This is basically a uh, way to serve up static files with rack. And then we bring in the hostess, which is our gem server. And then you can't see it, but we bring in rack maintenance by David Dollar, which basically says serve this file whenever any other URL that's hit. So basically, if uh, all the nice maintenance pages aren't hit, then rack, then the maintenance page shows. So this has been great because now I don't have to worry about people yelling at me when I'm sleeping. <laughs> um, can't see it. Let's go back. Okay, so the next big part of Gem Cutter are gem plugins. Gem plugins are a relatively new feature of Ruby Gems that I feel aren't being used enough. Um, this is how gem push works. Uh, I originally had no idea how people were going to interact with the API for Gem Cutter, and I read uh, a blog post on Gem Graph. I think it's basically like a dependency grapher that uh, it was implemented as a gem plugin. So I looked through that and I said, yes, I want gem push. I like Git so much. I'm going to do that. And the funny thing is that we've been getting uh, we've been getting issues on GitHub that people are trying to do gem push origin their gem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sorry. So the way that works, oh, I got to get larger again. Um, so the way that works is you have a lib Ruby gems plugin file in your gem, and those files are loaded before any but any other file in Ruby gems. And that implementation is sort of weird. Um, it's great because it lets us do commands like gem push and gem graph. But the problem is that anything you put in that live Ruby gems plugin will be loaded for everyone that has that gem installed. One example of this, I had a your URL, all caps, constant in that file. So if you try to like load any other um, app with Ruby gems, that URL constant would be there. So you just have to really make sure that any libraries or any constants you're bringing in at that point are delayed as much as possible. Otherwise, you're going to get in a heap of trouble, like I did. Um, so in that file, you basically call gem command manager, uh, register command. So you say, here's the command I want. And then you make sure you've brought in a subclass of gem command. And all it really needs, there's some other extraneous methods, but the only important one is execute. So when you call gem push, it calls execute. So that's really how easy it is. And I really think that if you're building something that hooks into Ruby gems, or at least has to do anything with Ruby gems, it should be done as a gem plugin. You shouldn't need a separate binary. Okay. So the next big part of gem cutter is delayed job. Uh, like I said, uh, I originally didn't have a, uh, or maybe I didn't say. Uh, I originally had people uh, push gems, and it would instantly like upload and index, and that was a bad idea. So I, I needed some sort of um, background processing, and Heroku supports. Delayed job, so I went with that, uh, and it's really been a pleasure to work with. Uh, I know there's a ton of block, a ton of job queues now, but this works really well. Um, here's the way it's used in Gem Cutter. So we have a Gem Cutter class that it's not really active record, but there's a save on it, and um, it basically writes the gem, which is another write to the file system or S3, and then we uh, use delayed job to enqueue the same class. So what happens there is that delayed job serializes this, this class as YAML dumps it in the database, and then, shove, and then continues on. So then we say, hey, you registered your gem, thanks. And that takes seconds instead of minutes, which is, I think, a big win, because you get to learn immediately if your gem messed up for some reason. So then there's, in the background, there's a delayed jobs worker that runs along, finds the uh, entry in the database, pulls it out, deserializes it, and then calls perform. So perform is where we update the index. So, this has been exceptionally easy to do. I really like that you can just sort of queue up the same object you're working with. I know there's this whole way with delayed job of like making job structs or something, but I think this is the most conceptually sound way to do it. Um, the, the other thing we use delayed job for is download processing. So every gem that's ever downloaded, we keep track of it. So hopefully we'll see some cool graphs eventually. So yeah, testing. Testing's a huge part of gem cutter. Uh, it's a huge part of all of how I develop. I definitely haven't been accepting any patches without testing, and I won't. Um, so I was drinking a lot of Thoughtbot Kool-Aid. So uh, I use Shoulda, and Shoulda's great. I love it. Uh, I also use Factory Girl. I don't want to go into fixtures. That argument's been over with. Uh, what I do really like is double R or RR. I, I don't know the right way to say it. Double R. Double R, all right. So um, it's a mocking and stubbing library that I feel is the most Ruby way to do mocking and stubbing. And I'm probably using it wrong because I just learned test buys. 
So you can go in there and yell at me if I'm doing it wrong. But uh, I think RR is an awesome library that if you haven't looked in li into other mocking libraries and if you've seen Mocha and if you've seen the tons of other ones, you need to look into RR. And finally, Cucumber. Cucumber has been pretty much uh, my saving grace for this project. Uh, I started with Cucumber from the very beginning. And the cool thing about it is that uh, I wrote a feature like to push gems right when it was too little Sinatra app. And then as I moved the Sinatra apps to Rails, I could still run those same features, and I could know that the site worked. So I knew the transition to Rails was done when the test passed again. So having these integration points like where the API hits the site, uh, tested by Cucumber, has been extremely helpful. And this is going to look horrible. Oh, it works. <laughs> and of course, you can't read it. So this is the uh, Cucumber feature for pushing a gem. So given your sign up and confirm with an email, uh, you've got a built gem on your system, and you've got an API key with our service. When you push it, then it should work, right? Then <laughs> you should be able to go to the page, see the see the gem, and make sure that the right version's up there. And I'm sorry that you can't see it in the back, but uh, these cucumber scenarios, I think, really uh, they help me sleep. <laughs> um, so I encourage you to look into cucumber if you haven't. So yeah, other features. We're getting towards the bottom. Jeez. Um, there's a lot of really neat features in RubyGems that no one knows about. And unless if you're like diving through RubyGems code, you don't learn about them. So uh, maybe you do, and that's great, but I'm going to tell you right now. Um, so the first big deal is pre-release versions, and that's in the data. Um, so pre-release versions are basically a way to specify alpha or beta releases. I know Yehuda talked about it a little. Um, so basically you tack on a, a bunch of letters to your gem version name, so you can do dash pre or dash a or dash bananas, kites, whatever you want. And it will be counted as a pre-release gem. So this is a way that instead of like forking a gem or instead of having like your own personal gem server, just use pre-release versions. Um, when gem cutter gets a hold of one of these, uh, it places it in a separate index. And you can only install pre-release gems when you tack on dash dash pre or dash dash pre-release when you're doing a gem install. So this is a, a big deal that I don't think enough people use yet. Uh, another big deal is uh, development dependencies. So I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with defining de dependencies for gem specs. So this is, for example, Rails depends on active support, action mailer, so on and so forth. Uh, but you can also de you can also define what uh, testing libraries and what uh, mocking frameworks and so on and so forth your library depends on. So that way, um, if you want to find out what you need in order to hack on a gem, you've got it right here. So the nice thing is that Gem Cutter displays each of these really clearly on the gem view page. So you can see really easily what the gem depends on and what you need to get going. So this is not working yet, just a disclaimer. Uh, so one of the biggest things I started, or I, I knew I had to do when I started Gem Cutter is that I had to link somehow to outside resources. This site is clearly not RubyForge. We are not going to do code hosting and other things. And um, I had needed a way to say, this is where you get the code, or this is where the bug tracker lives. And um, the way I did that right now is there's one form on the site to fill out. And that's the only form on the site besides logging in and signing up and forgetting your password. So I want to do everything possible to kill that form. Uh, I want the site to be read-only as, po read as possible, so the gem spec is the interface to gem cutter. So the final piece of the puzzle is pushing all those links into the gem spec, which hopefully I want to do soon. Uh, I'm talking to some of the RubyGems guys about it, and they seem, they seem okay with it. So um, the way I would like to see it is that there's a hash of links. Um, so it could be that easy. I'm not sure when this is going to work, but that's what I want. Okay, so I know you can't see it, but I'm going to talk about some of the things that are up and coming for GemCutter. Uh, the first big thing is rdoc.info. Uh, if you haven't seen the site, please go to it. Uh, this is a automatic gem or automatic documentation builder that runs Yard, and I really think Yard is the next step above RDoc. Uh, it's got it's RDoc okay, <laughs> it's RDoc compatible, and um, it's got a lot of really neat features on top of it. And um, I really think that it's the way going forward, and I'm going to be pushing it as much as possible. So this site builds documentation for GitHub projects right now. So you give it like your GitHub username and uh, the project name and then it just builds the documentation and keeps it up to date as you commit. 
So I want the same thing for gem cutter. So when you push your uh, gem, it automatically builds doc documentation for you. And I think that this is going to be a big win just because it'll force people to actually document their libraries. <laughs> uh, another cool thing uh, that's sort of a service hook, and hopefully we'll have like a general service hook system like after you push, is uh, Caliper, which you can't see, but this is metric foo, what Caliper does. I think there was a lightning talk about it last night. Uh, it's basically hosted metric foo. So uh, I want when you push a gem, uh, metrics will be built. So I think <laughs> this kind of thing that like after you push a gem, all these other services get activated. It's going to be big going forward. So another big deal is uh, readme's and search. Um, you may have heard of RPAN, maybe not. Um, I, one of the things I want is a much better uh, searching uh, feature for gem cutter. Right now, it's really bad. It just looks through the titles and descriptions, but uh, I want it. I want it to be much improved. And we just haven't had time to, to look at that yet. But another, a big piece of this is putting the readme's for every gem on the, uh, the gem page. So you don't have to go to GitHub to find it, or you don't have to go to some other site to find it. It's all, the information's all right there. And if we're searching that content too, that'll help people find gems a lot easier. So hopefully, um, re hopefully Gem Cutter can become this sort of central site where people will go for all sorts of information regarding gems. All right, and finally, there's gem forking. So this is sort of a big controversy. Uh, as the um, whole debacle with GitHub gems was winding down, uh, I sort of realized that we needed to support this same workflow. Just because they stopped building gems for people mean, doesn't mean that we can't support forked gems. Um, I guess the first thing to say is that we do support forked gems. Like you can take a gem spec, tack your name onto it, so I could have like Q rush my gem and then push it. And if that gem doesn't exist, then you own it. So that sort of works in the GitHub fashion right now. But the way we're going to go forward with it is have people register subdomains on gemcutter.org. So um, this should be really neat, because we're going to give you a blank index of gems, and then you can put whatever you want there. So it could be really cool, because people will be able to put whatever they want up there. But it could be really bad, because um, you might have your own crazy version of Rails that does crazy things that no one, no one should ever do, and um, no one should, no one else should ever install it. And if you have it in your source list, then that will get installed. So I really want to push that RubyGems.org moving forward is going to be the canonical repository that we can trust. And the only way we can do this, because um, I don't know about you, but I can't trust anybody else. <laughs> uh, I want to trust uh, the gem signing and certification stuff that's baked into RubyGems right now. And I think as a community, we need to learn more about it. I don't know enough about it right now. But I want to be able to say, I know who this gem was from, and I want it. So I think going forward, uh, more education, documentation, and just learning about that in general will be big. But as for gem forking, uh, I still think this is going to be a huge win, no matter how much of a mess we get into um, with different weird versions of gems being on people's subdomains. And uh, so yeah, this will be a fun feature to, to, to do. And hopefully, it will be coming soon. So yeah, I just really want to emphasize that this is our gem host now. This is the community's gem host. Um, it's an open source project. I've been running it like Rubinius. So if you submit a patch, you can ask me for core access, and I'll give it to you. It's that simple. Um, I've been trying to really instill a sense of trust among all the people that have access and all the people that are just hanging out. Uh, watching Gem Cutter go on, and trying to emphasize that this is our project now. If we want to see it evolve in ways that we've never imagined before, we can do that. We can. It's not locked into some crazy system, or it's not some other language we don't want to work on. It's Ruby. Let's hack on it. So yeah. So just want to emphasize that. Uh, let's make it awesome. This is our gem host. Let's do it. So yeah. Thanks. If you want to, the site is obviously there. Um, if you want the code, it's at GitHub. And feel free to talk to us on Freenode when I'm not at the conference and have an internet connection. <laughs> All right. Yes? Uh, one, of, one of my favorite things about the CPAM is that there's sort of namespacing and categorization of uh, CPAM packages. And there's nothing like that in Ruby. And I'd love to see the search get better. Uh, it would also be great to say, like, I need a gem that does something like this. I'd be able to like look at all the options and see like a category of 
you know, five gems that might solve a problem in a specific problem domain. Okay, so the question was, uh, is gem cutter a CPAN? <laughs> and uh, I haven't honestly used CPAN, I'm not a pro hacker. But uh, I think moving towards some sort of neat recommendation system or just an easier way for people to find gems is important. Tagging. There we go. Okay. So let's make that happen. Josh. Uh, the, so it's great that it's an open source project and you want people to contribute. What are you using to manage the roadmap and issues and you know, organizing of that? Okay, so nothing yet. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely going to get better at that. I definitely want to make it easier for people to get off and running with the site. Definitely, I think we should move to a legitimate issue tracker and uh, actually have milestones and releases and stuff. So yes, I will. Ooh. All right. All right, Yehuda. Did you have a question? Or? I just wanted to say tagging doesn't actually work in scale. Like, look at Rails' bug tracker tag. Yeah. It's, it's a really awesome early idea, but it totally fails when there's like a million tags. Okay. <laughs> You mentioned uh, you'd like to see a bunch of pretty graphs come out of the information you've been collecting from the cutter. Would you uh, offer that information to the community so that we can play around with it? And yes, definitely. Is that yeah. available now? Or is that it's not available now. Like, I, we're tracking every single download for every gem. So it's in the database. We just haven't exposed it yet. But I'm definitely open to uh, evolving the API. Right now, the API is pretty primitive. And I think before, oh, this is one thing I should have mentioned. So we're merging the gem cutter plugins, so gem push, gem owner, and whatnot, into RubyGems proper. So part of that effort, among with figuring out RubyGems and how that works, has been uh, moving the API for the site to legitimate like API v1 something something. So I think moving forward, like growing the API and making stuff like that available is definitely possible. Yes, I should back Yes. It might be interesting to publish some of your information uh, as, an, as an RDF repository. So if you would use my data and existing tools to search. Okay. I, I actually, so the question was uh, should we publish RDF data? And honestly, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm definitely more than, op I'm, I'm more than open to it. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Great. Yeah, feel free to come up and bug me about this. So thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>